Nomi, Thaís, um minuto de introdução. Sou Nomi, apresentar-se a todos. Sou Nomi. Quem vai traduzir para eles que eu vou falar? Vamos saber, não. Vamos saber. Aloha, my name is Glenn Lee, and I'm from the state of Hawaii uh, in the United States of America. I'm just happy to be here. I'm um, happy to, to have the opportunity to showcase um, STEM education. Uh, my background is I do robotics, and I'm a high school teacher uh, in a very rural, uh, isolated, small school in Hawaii. <coughs> so once again, I'm just very happy to be here, and I look forward to sharing about our programs. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nortana Kush. I come from Turkey. Ayvacık Anaokulu Samsun'da Türkiye'de bulunan bir okul ve orada bir okul müdürü olarak görev yapmaktayım. 11 yıllık öğretmenim, 11 yıllığımı tamamladım. Ee, hem çocuklarımızın eğitim e, seviyelerinin daha iyi bir e, noktaya gelebilmesi için hem de e, sadece çocuklarımız yeterli değil tabii ki annelerimiz, babalarımız, oradaki insanların daha iyi şartlara sahip olabilmesi için çalışmalar gerçekleştirdik. E, ben e, hem öğretmenim hem e, sosyoloji mezunuyum e, ve benim için eğitim ve toplum iç içedir. Bunun için e, değişimin toplu olarak yapılması gerektiğini düşünüyorum e, ve ben e, bir eğitimci olarak, bir öğretmen olarak Hepimizin değişimin öncüleri olarak e, olduğumuzu düşünüyorum. E, ve öğretmen olduğum için de her zaman gurur duyuyorum. This is my 11th year in teaching career and uh, I am the head of kindergarten department in a city called Samsun and a town called Bafra. It is 65 kilometers away from Samsun. And then I am so proud to be in teaching uh, career and uh, I am also graduating in sociology and I am uh, inside and outside with the community integrating community into the classroom and the classroom into the community this is my belief my name is Eddie Wu I'm from Sydney Australia and I'm an art teacher I, I teach the art of mathematics. Huh? You got confused for a second there. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I believe that mathematics is much more than just numbers and calculations and formulas. It's actually an amazingly creative and collaborative pursuit, and that's what I want everyone to see. For the last five years, I've been filming my classroom lessons and putting them online for free because I believe that mathematics is a subject for everyone. So I hope I get to see lots of you on Sunday at that masterclass. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andrea Zafiraku, and I am a real art teacher, actually. Um, and um, I also teach textiles, and I'm a senior leader in a school in Brent, London. It's a, um, a very diverse community that I work in, and our students do come from, unfortunately, quite um, uh, backgrounds which suffer from poverty. Uh, what I do is just connect them with the arts, connect them with and engage them with other uh, different types of activities so that they can then flourish and become incredible human beings. Hi, my name is Koen Timmers. I'm from Belgium. I teach in two schools right now. Uh, and the first one I have been teaching for 18 years web design. The second one uh, for one year I'm training future teachers. And I think that the learning is global. I try to make learning global during by launching several projects. And uh, in the Kakuma project I've been uh, trying to educate refugees in, in Africa. And right now we have a community of 175 different country, uh, educators, I'm sorry, in 45 different countries. Wow. Marjorie. Hello, I'm Marjorie Brown from South Africa, Johannesburg. I was an anti-apartheid activist and now I'm a fossil in the history classroom. I'm a, a resource. <laughs> um, I, South Africa is a very unequal country, so I work um, with 
over 80 schools in literacy projects, aside from my history teaching. I teach global citizenship through Model United Nations, and I sit on boards of early childhood education. Good day, Mabuhay, long live. I am Jesus Igdam Katigan Insilada from the Philippines. Um, I have an ethnic name which, mean, which is Igdaman, which means someone so, who has so much to share. I've been teaching for more than 15 years in a very remote area, and I advocate culture-based education because I do believe that to make education inclusive and very relevant, it must be based on the realities of our students. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Luis Miguel Bermúdez from Colombia, Bogotá. Eh, yo primero que todo agradecerles por este, por este espacio. Mi mensaje, el, ahorita Colombia, ustedes la mayoría sabe que Colombia está en diálogos de paz, está en el proceso de paz. Y ahorita el reto de la educación colombiana es educar para el posconflicto. Y en ese posconflicto eh, estamos recibiendo en la escuela todos esos hijos de la violencia, especialmente las niñas que se han convertido en el, en el motín de guerra de, de este conflicto que duró más de 50 años en mi país. Hoy como educador estamos recibiendo en nuestras escuelas todos esos niños de las diferentes regiones que ven en las, en las grandes ciudades una gran oportunidad para reconstruir sus vidas. Entonces ese es el gran reto que tengo como, como docente y es el mensaje que le doy para el mundo, a que colaboren que siempre miren a Colombia en el sector educativo porque es en la educación en el que está la esperanza de mi país. Gracias. Um, the message from uh, Luis is um, about uh, talking about Colombia. Colombia is going through the process of a post conflict and they are going through the through a peace process, and then how education is dealing with those children. We were exposed to all the conflict, conflict with the drugs and with the violence, so especially with the girls. So his program and what he's teaching at the school is mainly, you know, to help those children to have a brighter future after what they have suffering, being part of the of the war in Colombia. Thank you. Hi, hi. My name is Diego. Uh, I'm from Brazil. Uh, convido vocês. Quero agradecer primeiramente por estar aqui e convido vocês para conhecer o projeto desenvolvido na escola Darcy Ribeiro, que é um projeto de gestão democrática, onde uma escola desacreditada em todo o país, é, através da mediação de conflitos, dar voz aos alunos é, e também a abertura para a comunidade fez a transformação da escola. Tínhamos grandes desafios, como 200 alunos por ano que abandonavam os estudos, e hoje é um grande desafio tornar a escola atrativa, e o nosso trabalho se baseia nisso. Então, nós temos Diego, do Brasil, aqui, do São Paulo State. Eu tenho o microfone. Então, o achievement que ele fez com a escola foi tornar a escola que estava em alta performance, com muitos estudantes que estavam deixando a educação, ele conseguiu tornar isso para trás with the help of local businesses and turn it into a community hub where children are happy to come and attend classes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara Nazielonka, and I teach English and international English at Namaste High School, Norway. I'm uh, a Pole working in Norway, and I moved to Norway at the age of 25. I teach um, English, but I try to implement and integrate technology and global projects in my work. Thank you.
I'm from a community that's very isolated in Hawaii. Most people, when they think of Hawaii, they think of Honolulu. Our school is very different. We're far away from Honolulu. Our demographics are very, very different. We have a lot of poor children. A lot of our students don't leave the community. And so prior to doing robotics, I was a math and science teacher for which I've been at the same school for 24 years. During the first five years of my teaching, I was trying to promote math and science, but a lot of my students were graduating from high school and did not want to pursue a career in math and science. And I got very frustrated and felt that I needed to do more than just teach formulas in the classroom and teach specific science co concepts in little mini labs. What I wanted to do was offer something more that had more of an application so that students could experience and feel like what it would be like. So for example, if I'm teaching math or science and I talk about engineering, I want to give that, bring that into the classroom. And so then came that opportunity for me to uh, do robotics in our school. Almost 20, and so I, we did that, started that 19 years ago. Almost 20 years ago, robotics was very in its infant stage and very little schools were doing it. And so we became almost the pioneers in which we, um, through a lot of trial and error and uh, successes and failures, uh, we've now developed this program where we're very global. I've been to, have taken my students to many different countries such as China, Japan, Australia, Canada. And um, we also host, for example, workshops for students in China. And every summer we get to go there and their government help brings our team over and we help train new, new schools into the idea of doing robotics and technology. The whole goal of our program is not to make all of our students become robotic scientists. The goal is to teach our kids to apply what they learn in the classroom because the world is always changing. And I always tell my students that when you do your, um, our projects in our classroom, we are trying to prepare you for jobs that don't even exist yet. Five years from now, there's gonna be a job that's gonna be newly created and hopefully our students will be prepared to be able to take on that challenge and if they have an interest in it, they can go and pursue that career. Thank you. So uh, at my school, we have academic line of studies and vocational, sorry. Uh, at Nersta High School, we have academic and vocational line of studies. And uh, this year, I teach skincare and um, healthcare line of studies. And it's really important for me to teach my students things that they can use in the future. So I try to implement ESP, which stands for English for Specific Purposes. So instead of asking my students to open a course book, I take them to skincare salon and I stay with them and they have to perform dif different kind of treatments. They have to show me what they are doing and it's uh, very relevant to their future because in the future they are not going to study, they are going to work in their field and that is why I think it's so important to teach things that they will be able to use in the future and it's dynamic learning, it's authentic learning, and we also try to connect the students with uh, professional workers who are already skin care therapists and who are working in the field who can share their experience with my students. Şu an görev yaptığım e, Ayvacık Anaokulu'nu 2009 yılında görevlendirdim. Burayı kurucu müdür olarak görevlendirdim. E, bomboş bir okuldu. E, devletimiz tarafından burayı kurmam ve burayı geliştirmem için görevlendirildim. E, bu yöneticilik süreci içerisinde hem fiziki olarak e, bu süreci devam ettirmem, çocuklarımıza daha iyi imkanlar kazandırmam gerekiyordu. Hem de buradaki e, ailelerin de bu eğitim sürecine katılması gerekiyordu. Ee, yaşım çok gençti. Ee, Türkiye'nin en genç yöneticilerinden biri olarak e, kurucu müdürlüğe görevlendirildim ve sonrasında idareci olarak devam ettim. Ee, tabii ki zorluklarımız vardı ama en güzel tarafları ben inandıkça bana inanan insanların sayısı arttı. Ee, hem oradaki ilçedeki insanlar hem de Türkiye'nin değişik bölgelerindeki insanlar e, daha güçlü olarak bana sarıldılar. Daha bir arada olduk. 
e, ve birlikte çok daha güzel çalışmalar gerçekleştirdik. Aslında e, burada olmam, şu an birlikte olma, e, şu an e, bu başarıyı elde etmiş olmam sadece benim başarım değil. Bana inanan insanların da başarısı, tüm Türkiye'nin başarısı. E, onun için biliyorum ki onlar benimle gurur duyuyorlar. E, ben de onlarla çok gurur duyuyorum. Türkiye'yi çok seviyorum. Ee, bu konuda yaşadığım zorluklar e, tabii ki e, ilk defa oraya bir anaokulunun kurulmasını sağlıyorsunuz. Kurucu müdür olarak görevlendiriliyorsunuz. Oradaki okulun kaderini siz belirliyorsunuz. İyi bir şekilde gelişimlerini sağlarsanız ve devam ettirirseniz çocuklarınıza çok iyi bir gelecek sağlayacaksınız. E, bunun için e, ben 65 kilometre uzaklıkta bir ilçede görev yapıyorum ama kesinlikle çocuklarımızın hayallerinin gerçekleştirilmesi, onların daha iyi imkanlara sahip olabilmesi için hiçbir engel tanımadım. Yaşımın e, çok genç olması... Ee, bazı kesimlerde acaba yapabilir mi, yaşı çok genç, başarılı bir okul yöneticiliği yapabilir mi diye düşünmesine sebep olmuştu. Ama kesinlikle bunun da böyle olmadığını gördüler ee, ve yaşın e, başarı için engel olmadığını gördüler. Okay, she, uh, I'm going to say very briefly because there was some repetition. Um, she started her job in 2009 and then when she was leading the group, the department of the kindergarten, uh, the society around her thought that she's too young to do that job and that was her the biggest difficulty and the challenges and obstacles. And then the more they, uh, she believed in that society that they could able to do that, she was able to change that belief in society that even young people can actually be successful of what they believe in, what their passions are for. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Diego now. I would like you, if it's possible, to tell us a little more about the community in which you live. Sua comunidade, um pouco mais sobre sua comunidade. É, eu trabalho numa comunidade bem carente de São José do Rio Preto, e, além disso, com altas taxas de é, violência e também de tráfico de drogas. So Diego works in a neighborhood, in an area of uh, Sao Paulo State, where there is a lot of violence and drug trafficking. É considerado uma das áreas mais perigosas é, do Brasil até, e do estado de São Paulo. It's one of the most dangerous parts of Brazil and the state of São Paulo. E quando eu fui para a escola Darcy Ribeiro, eu já sabia das dificuldades é, da escola, porque eu trabalhava numa escola próxima, então eu já conhecia a realidade da escola Darcy Ribeiro. So when he was invited to that area of uh, Sao Paulo State to be the principal of the school, he already assumed what the challenges will be, because at the time he was working in a nearby school of similar uh, type. Eu sabia das dificuldades e eu aceitei o desafio de ir para a Escola de Arce Ribeiro, porque na época da minha faculdade eu, eu criei um blog chamado Educação e Revolução, e nesse blog eu falei que eu gostaria de fazer um trabalho de transformação e de impacto na educação. So he was always passionate about bringing some revolutionary ideas in, into education, so during his student days he ran a blog where he was already uh, outlining how he would like to transform some of the low performing schools in his state. Eu amo desafios, né? É, na escola da Arce Ribeiro, o nosso projeto ele se baseia em 10 subtítulos, que são os projetos que fazem a diferença na escola. So his challenge at that school was how to get uh, help from local businesses to try to transform the atmosphere in the school. Nós tínhamos mais de 200 alunos que abandonavam os estudos, cerca de 60 suspensões por mês de 3 a 7 dias que os alunos ficavam fora da escola e também a comunidade além de ter muito medo da escola, ela não se sentia pertencente à escola. Right, so the community did not feel comfortable with the situation at school where there were many dropout students, so he was trying to create a more welcoming atmosphere where students would be kept away from street and would like to come to school. Então, os projetos se baseiam principalmente em três pontos. Okay. É, é a questão de dar voz aos alunos e tornar eles protagonistas das ações na escola, 
trazer a comunidade para dentro da escola e valorizar a questão, a cultura da paz através do diálogo, do saber ouvir. So he gave voice to his students, he taught them about the culture of the region and the country, and he made it into a community hub. Marvelous, thank you very much. I'm going to move to Eddie. Uh, for those of you who haven't picked this up, his uh, YouTube channel is rather brilliantly called WooTube. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you set it up? Five years ago, I taught a student who was only 16 years old, but he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And for anyone who's any familiar with that disease, incredibly aggressive, very violent, he was given about six months to live. When I was in year 10, the same age as him, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer, and I saw how much, what made my mother survive for over three and a half years, what her, was her purpose in life. That's what kept her going. And for this young man, I knew that being separated from school, spending six, seven weeks away from us at a time because he was in hospital, receiving radiotherapy or chemotherapy, it was going to take away the purpose of his life because he loved learning so very much. He loved being with his friends. And so in order to help him participate and still be a part of our class, our community of learners, I took my phone out of my pocket, uh, I put it up on the table and I hit record because when I was at school, I had a lot of trouble learning mathematics. Uh, English and history were my okay, favorite subjects, so I loved Simon's talk just now. Mathematics did not come naturally to me, and I knew that most people, and I would argue almost everyone in this room, cannot learn mathematics just by reading it from a textbook. Textbooks are a support, but they are not a replacement for a teacher. And so I wanted him to have a personal guide, mentor, who would help him learn. So this was five years ago. I started doing this. Uh, amazingly, he went into remission, but after he graduated, after two years of being my student, I realized that it wasn't just him who was watching my videos. It was people around the country. Uh, it was people around the world, in fact. Uh, over 200 countries are, are watching in, which to me is astonishing, but speaks to the fact that mathematics is a universal language. And as we move into the future, which is so relevant for the theme of this conference, it's something that every day becomes more and more important and central and useful to our lives. Amazing story. As you can probably tell, I'm, uh, I'm doing a kind of pendulum thing here. So I'm going to turn to Luis. Um, Luis, you do work on the curricular integration of sexual citizenship. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the challenges you face in your community? Bueno, eh, nuestra, en mi país nuestra cultura es bastante, eh, tiene una resistencia fuerte hacia todo lo que tiene que ver con los temas de, de sexualidad y la educación al respecto. Eh, y ahí es, y nuestra cultura es el principal obstáculo para poder implementar cualquier tipo de currículo de educación sexual. In general, in, mo in, in the Colombian culture, there's a, a big resistance to talk about education, e sexual, sexual education. So that it was one of the biggest challenge he presented, you know, when he wanted to implement the curriculum at the school. Eh, por ejemplo, en hay existe la creencia de que si se enseña educación sexual en los colegios, los adolescentes o los van a a ser personas promiscuas, que si se enseña educación sexual en edades tempranas se va a aumentar el número de parejas sexuales, que si se enseña educación sexual a edad temprana se van a aumentar los riesgos de, en, asociados a salud sexual y reproductiva. There is a, a general belief that if educa sexual education is taught in the schools, uh, the number of early pregnancies is going to increase the prostitution is going to increase and otherwise you know it was very difficult to convince you know the authorities that the effect of teaching uh, sexual education was going to be the opposite en resumen por ejemplo en en mi país eh, a las adolescentes a las mujeres adolescentes les impiden el acceso a los métodos de regulación de la fertilidad porque se cree que si un adolescente se empodera de su cuerpo, eh, está en contra de su virtud sexual. Allá en Colombia es muy importante 
lo que llaman la virginidad, mantenerse casta hasta el matrimonio. Y a partir de eso se genera una serie de violencias hacia las mujeres que terminan pues, efectivamente poniendo, colocándolas en espacios de vulnerabilidad. In other words, anticonceptive methods are not advisable for teenagers. You know, teenagers, I mean, the, they are said believe that the ladies should arrive to the marriage uh, without having sexual experiences. And if the case, you know, that the girls have been exposed to sexual experiences, they are discriminated by the society. Y, pues, efectivamente, todo eso también va hacia la política. Y eso es lo más triste en nuestro país, que esta cultura impermea los círculos políticos e impiden que, por ejemplo, una educación basada en derechos humanos sexuales y reproductivos se desarrolle en las escuelas. Gracias. Thank you. Yes, and then this is very linked to the political situation in the country, and therefore uh, sexual education is not taught in the schools. Thank you. Marvelous. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, they say when you chair events like this, you're supposed to be completely neutral. <coughs> but you may have noticed I'm British, so I'm going to say, go on, Andrea. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit more about your work up in uh, northwest London, and specifically um, the stuff you do around on-the-spot coaching? Okay. Um, uh, I, I lead on teaching and learning in my school as a senior leader, and I think one of the, the best parts of my job is working and developing other teachers, and especially the new um, qualified teachers, the new teachers who are passionate, who are just coming into the profession, who really want to make a difference to the classroom. And these are the teachers that will do absolutely everything. They will work the hardest, they will spend a lot of time planning their lessons, but sometimes they're not getting it right. So on-the-spot coaching is a technique which we use in our school, and what you do is you are either in the classroom Um, sitting at the back with either a whiteboard and you are, as the teacher is talking, you are either telling them, writing something, holding it up to them um, and then they will implement that strategy. So it could be, um, now's a good time to pause and let them reflect or now's a good time to answer a question. So we can do it in that particular technique or um, by um, having them record and being um, in another room watching the recording and being um, almost like someone having um, being in their ear and just <laughs> tell them, now just go around to the back of the room and just see what that student's doing. So l you, are, you are visibly in the classroom providing support for that teacher so that you are almost um, enabling them to progress um, and to create the best outcomes for their children. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to... Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how um, your work as an indigenous person and a teacher has, uh, has informed your teaching practice? Yes, I would like to tell the world I am an indigenous person and I am teaching um, indigenous learners. And that is why it is a necessity for me to use uh, the pedagogies that cater, uh, that pedagogies that are anchored on, their cult on our culture their realities. And so um, since I started in 2000, um, up to now I've been uh, ab uh, an advocate of culture-based teaching to make education really um, relevant and inclusive. Uh, doing this, um, in the first place, I make education very relevant to them. And second, I boost our morale to think and to believe that we indigenous persons are special, talented, and we can make, uh, we can achieve something and we could make a difference even in this changing world. I think that is very basic to anchor every lesson and the realities and culture of the students before they could uh, embrace Uh, technological changes, and that could also make them become aware of their identity, and that would eventually make them accepting of the culture of other communities. Another, yet another amazing story. Um, <coughs> I'm going to turn to Kern, who's immediately on my right, and I'd like you to explore a little bit more about the projects that you run 
and why you think so many people are prepared to get involved? Okay. So I think that we, I believe that we have to focus on learning and not on uh, teaching. And we can learn in so many different ways and formal education is that many times, uh, that often limited to memorization, knowledge acquisition, examination, etc. So I decided to create global projects because we live in an era in which we have technology which allows us to connect students from around the world. And what's better than learning about global issues directly from students living in those countries? So I'd like to connect my students with those students from, from these countries and have the immediate impressions from the students. So my last project involved 250 schools across 69 different countries. It was a climate action project and the students had to focus during four weeks on four different topics like what is climate change? Uh, what are the causes and uh, effects? And they had to share their, uh, their findings in videos, which I shared on my website. website. And then they had Skype lessons with, with each other, and they were able to share their findings. Um, and that way, they learned in their own classroom, collaborative learning, learning by doing, and then in the next stage from each other, from their global peers. I think uh, one of the most amazing things about this <laughs> One of the most amazing things about the whole festival here is those connections that can be made. So let's make sure those connections actually happen. Um, so I turn, last but not least, of course, to Marjorie from South Africa, who has set up a school, I believe, with a chap called Martin Makahi. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? That was my <coughs> first teaching post um, in the 1980s at the height of apartheid. And I did not want to become a teacher in a white suburb in a very segregated South Africa. So seven of us started one of the first non-racial schools in South Africa. And it was quite an act of defiance. Um, and it proved that children of all races, cultures, are equally intelligent when given equal resources. And that's... <laughs> And while I was teaching there, um, I was witness to resettlement camps in the area. So I left teaching and fought forced removals for 15 years, became a human rights activist, and then went back into teaching in 1994 to once again build a new democracy. And I'm a history teacher, and as Simon Sharma says, you have to have history to learn about that past and build the new narrative of your country because... 60% of children in our country do not do history as a subject. And the very act by which they were moved by force into resettlement camps, they do not know that that act is what defined the social and economic geography of our country. And so I right now am teaching about that past lest we forget. What an amazing way to finish the lineup. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a special, uh, a special moment now. The chairman of the Varkey Foundation, Mr. Sonny Varkey, has arrived. A surprise <laughs> guest, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, um, we're delighted to have our founder, Mr. Sonny Varkey, with us here today to congratulate the achievements of our top 10 teachers and to present them with their medals. So, um, <laughs> if, <laughs> what we'll do is just ask you to come one by one, and uh, Rebecca will, will uh, give, you, give you the medals. So first, could I invite Glenn to come forward? <laughs> and Nurtan from Turkey. Um, Eddie from Australia. Andrea from the UK. <laughs> Cohen.
Owen from South Africa, uh, Belgium. Belgium. <laughs> South Africa's name. <laughs> try and get this right. I have a degree in geography. Um, <laughs> Marge from South Africa. <laughs> Jesus, if you come forward from the Philippines. Luis from Colombia. <laughs> Diego, please come forward. Finally, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. One final round of applause for our founder, Sunny Barkey, and our top ten.